so I think the, uh, the next step here is we're just going to do a round uh, with me asking some questions and feel free to interrupt each other and, you know, do what you need to do uh, to talk about and then we'll open up to the floor for some conversation as well. The big question that strikes me, though, is that we talked about this Dauphin experiment for a, a long time now and we talk about the basic guaranteed income idea. And the problem is, is there's a historical context to that. That was the 1970s. Do you actually see the, what, the, what the differences or can you talk about about what you think the differences would be like if we were to do something like that in this day and age. Sure, that's a really good point. I mean, is the data dated? Is it telling us anything that's relevant to the 21st century? I think if you think about the labor market responses, I think they would be even smaller now than they were in the 1970s. Women are much more attached to the labor force now than they were in the 1970s. At that time, it was much more typical to have a part-time job just to, you know, boost the family income a little bit, but it wasn't a career. I think that's not the case now for many women in society. So I, I think that those labor market responses we saw then, small as they were, would be even smaller today. I think we probably wouldn't find that big increase in high school completion rates because I think it's much more common for kids to finish high school today. Um, Dauphin, you know, a, a rural community in Manitoba in the mid-70s, completing high school was still a luxury, especially for boys, because boys had alternatives. You could be 16 and you could go out and you could get a job that paid pretty well. And so a lot of the kids in low-income families were under pressure to become self-sustaining, maybe to contribute to the family, but mostly to pay their own way. I think that's probably not the case now. Kids are, in a lot of families, much more likely to finish high school. So I think we'd see the changes in college enrollment, in job training. I still think we'd see the educational response. I think it would just show up in a slightly different way. Um, I think, in some sense, the, the bigger concepts, the bigger ideas of, about human behavior are pretty much timeless. I think Jessica made a very good point. The very first point she made was that poverty takes away choices. And we see that all the time. You know, you're collecting employment and income assistance, and you have a whole set of rules that you have to follow. Right? In order to qualify for most of the programs that are available, you have to satisfy everybody else's expectations about what you're going to do with the money and what you're going to do with your time and how you're going to behave. And the nice thing about a guaranteed income is it frees you up a little bit. What it really says, and this is going to sound terribly libertarian, to, um, but it's going to sound that way. What it really says is I trust you to make your own decisions in your own best interests. I think you probably know more about what you need and what your family needs than I know. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I that's think empowering families. That's just <laughs> I, th I, think, I think it's not such a bad thing to empower people to make their own choices and to make their own mistakes. Sometimes people don't necessarily spend their money in the wisest ways, but you know, people learn from that. I think that's a good thing. Actually, I have a question for you, which is, it seems to me that you're basically saying you, if you were to do a pilot study now, you would expect the same thing as what we did back then. Yep. So should we do a pilot study now? <laughs> You know, you know I, I'm torn here because I, <laughs> I have a couple of interests. On the one hand, I think we already know a lot, and I think sometimes pilot studies are used to delay political progress. People say, well, now is not the right time. Right? Now is not the right time. We need more study, and a study can sometimes postpone making decisions for five years or six years or 10 years or 15 years, and we already have a lot of data. People question the data. They question its relevance, but it's already there if, if people want to know about it. On the other hand, I'm a researcher, and I, you know, I'm, I've, I've got a grant application half written at home, not about this, about something else, and I'm thinking, man, if I could get my hands on the opportunity to design that project today, I would have asked the right questions, I would have collected the right data, because there's a whole lot of stuff I wish they'd asked that they didn't ask in the 1970s. We would have a tremendous amount of social data. We'd know almost everything about the way society functioned, and that would be a great opportunity, but that's a very self-interested response. So maybe we can give you the grant, you do the research, and meanwhile we can just implement the policy. <laughs> There's also though, a historical context, as a political scientist, there's a, there's a historical political context we have to understand too, and neoliberalism wasn't really much of, a, of an idea at that time uh, in the 1970s. Now it is, you cannot escape it, uh, the idea of deficits, etc. So again, this makes a political appetite uh, for the implementation of such a, an idea out of reach, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Well, let me put on my economist hat for a minute. I actually work at the Health Sciences Center. 
And so I challenge you to go there and to walk down the hallways and to look at the people who are in the hospital, to go to clinic and to sit in the waiting room and to recognize that a whole lot of the costs of the, social, of the healthcare system are in fact the consequences of poverty. It's really, really hard to distinguish between treating poverty and treating health conditions. And I talk about health because that's the context I know and it's the data I have. But it's not a big step to say, okay, let's go into the schools and let's talk about special ed. Let's go and talk about youth justice. I mean, we're already paying a tremendous amount of money in this society. We're paying it for basic income assistance, but we're also paying it for all of these social programs that are treating the consequences of poverty. And it's, it's crazy. I mean, so as an economist, let, let me make the business case for you. If I can save you $4.5 billion in the healthcare system tomorrow, isn't this something we should at least talk about? And maybe it won't pay for itself. Maybe there's a net new cost, but at the same time, at the same time, that additional cost is buying improvements in quality of life. So yeah, I do think times have changed. I think you'd make the argument in a very different way in the 1970s. You could still talk about social justice without people sort of laughing and, sure. <laughs> and walking away. Um, but you know, you, you can make the case in very different ways. There's, 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 a, there's a real business case for these kinds of social investments. Yuri, did you want to answer that, or, uh, or Jessica? Feel free. I, I fully agree with what you just said. Okay, there you go. I love it. Great endorsement. I think when we talk about the quality of life, it's important to also identify, well, what does that mean for, for different families? Because um, I feel like it's, it's, a, uh, it's looked at um, poorly for a family or a mother to choose to stay home and raise her children. I have three children that I'm raising, and I've worked since I graduated from high school, and um, I would have loved to have stayed home and raised my children, and it's not because I, um, I, I didn't want to contribute to our society, but I really believe in that strength of nurturing those relationships and building healthy men. I've got three boys, so that's my plan is to, to make sure that they're healthy and that they're confident and that they can continue in you know, what we're building as a community. And I think that uh, we, we don't have that opportunity as much anymore with the, um, uh, what is it called? That we stay home after the baby, I'm <laughs> losing my... Parental. Uh, yeah, like parental leave and stuff like that is, um, it's always almost shamed. And uh, I think that's really sad. You know, so I, I think one of the, and this, this has very much come out in both um, the responses here, but what, one of the key points that we need to really think about is sort of the, the, sort of the fundamental idea of people behind this, right? So there is really a sense, I mean, one, one of the things that's very clear with the basic income idea is that we kind of trust people to live their lives, to, you know, to do the best they can for their children, to kind of take care of each other more or less. Okay, you know, of course, we're always going to have some weird cases here and there, but that's unavoidable. Any policy is going to create that. So the question really is, do you want a society where, you know, in some sense, we're happy to give people, like, a little bit of support, but it has to be checked and controlled and double-checked, and, you know, and in some sense, these people themselves have to, you know, ask for it and beg for it, or do you want a society where you say, look, at the end of the day, we're going to give people some floor, some platform, and we let them lead their lives. And we're going to trust that if you give people these sort of opportunities, they will, you know, by and large, take these opportunities and move society and move their own lives in a direction that really, you know, most of us would think that's absolutely fine. It's funny because reading the comments in the Winnipeg Free Press on some online stories, I think a lot of people that read that would totally disagree with you. They would say that, you know, these people need to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and what's wrong with them. And First Nations people have been completely targeted in a lot of these kinds of comments. What's the matter with you? We pay for everything. Why don't you just, quote unquote, get over it? So uh, how do we respond to that? So, so I have a, I mean, I give you the same response I just uh, told you before. I totally agree people should pick themselves up by the bootstraps, so let's give them bootstraps. Okay, <laughs> that's what a basic income is. Yeah. I think it's really important for um, society to know and accept and acknowledge all of those things that 
Um, Aboriginal people are in some of the positions that they are based on government policy. And I think if, if anyone knows about any of those issues, you, you would know that, that uh, the policies or the, uh, the situations that Aboriginal people are in, the reserves, the poverty, the dependency is all part of government policy. So that was not something that we just decided to uh, you know, quit working or quit trying to contribute or fit into the community, but it was something that was imposed on us. And if, if we're expected, and, and I say we because I, I am an Aboriginal person who is very much um, a part of all of these systems that are opposing to Aboriginal people. Um, it's, it has been uh, imposed over generations and no way is that going to disappear over a generation. There's been lots of damage um, and a lot of issues that I'm not even going to get into, but this is exactly uh, acknowledging the history and now taking all of that information and moving forward with it, with Aboriginal people and not for them. I think that was good. Very good. Thank you. The other, the other thing too is in this day and age with the election cycle being the way it is, the media cycle being the way it is, long term, long, long -term uh, outcomes are really, really difficult to sell when you've got you know, three, three years or four years until the next election. So how would you respond to that? What would you, what would you say if you were trying to sell, oh, let me see, Mr. Harper, would you be interested in, uh, yeah, yeah, this kind of, how would he sell it? Uh, wait, wait until Harper's finished and then try with the next one. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, so one, one of the options, and this is the option that most people sort of really are investigating at the moment, is that we try to do this piecemeal thing. And, you know, so, so very concretely, uh, for example, pensioners are always kind of singled out as a good group to start with. Why? Because, you know, in many countries, basically, you have something close to a basic income as a basic pension anyway. They're basically voters, so they're a powerful group. And, you know, pensioners are usually regarded as deserving citizens. So you don't have any of the hard problems. So let's start with that. Let's start to put in place anything like a proper kind of decent system. We, meanwhile, we can study some of the effects. If that works, then we can try and expand it to other groups, such as, you know, child benefit on the other side is an obvious one. But we can start singling out um, education, for example, students, student grants would be another one as well. So in some sense, you create a patchwork of different groups various ways. And along the way, you know, you, you sort of modify existing systems of assistance. You turn it all a little bit more, you know, less, less restrictive, less conditional. And over time, perhaps, you know, in the longer run, we can get to a basic income. But these are results that you can put in place within an electoral cycle, if you wish, within a government cycle. And so, through, well, I, th I think that's brilliant, by the way. But I also wonder if it would be easier to do it at a provincial level first and then have it broadened to a national policy uh, as well. What do you think, Evelyn? Uh, what, what's your sense? Um. I'm not sure I have an answer to that. I'm not sure that a province like Manitoba has the fiscal capacity to do that. I think if this were Ontario, if this were Quebec, we might talk about that. Um, it's a small province we're in, and I think, I think frankly, um, the federal government is is maybe the best choice. This piecemeal, this piecemeal um, response. I mean, in some sense, the provinces are are so dependent on the boutique tax credits and things that come out of the federal government that it's it's hard to respond to. So if, so if I hear you correctly then, it has to be sort of federal and what we should probably do is wait for a change in government before it happens. Or take what Jürgen just said seriously and, and talk about the piecemeal changes. You know, is income splitting maybe the way to go? Maybe maybe there's a better alternative to income splitting, right? Yeah. You know, there are a lot of little policies that work towards um, a guaranteed annual income, that work towards the kinds of principles we're talking about in better ways than some of the policies that have been produced and without um, without invoking this huge superstructure of a guaranteed annual income. 
Well, I think uh, we've had enough of a kind of tat a tat up here, and I think I will allow uh, other people to have the opportunity now to engage uh, in conversation here. So uh, if you have some questions, please feel free to grab the microphone from him.